Will and Pete, four big stories in the news from Russia and Ukraine to is the republic lost with a stop in Tennessee to debate whether or not a grown man should wear a jersey. Here are four stories with Will and Pete. Story one, Ukraine, Russia. I just broached the topic as we talked about Mm -hmm. it on Fox and Friends this weekend. You and I have had some fascinating conversations offset about an issue where I'm not sure we're 100 percent simpatico, 100 percent on the page, and neither of us are 100 percent dedicated to our position. That's fair. I feel, you know, this this story maybe for us is best done through the prism of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. I feel like all incentive and evidence points back to the United States of America. I can't. I can't line up and rationalize much incentive that points to Russia. Now, that doesn't mean that I know, right? I don't know. I don't have access to all information. But I, I, I think it's part of my hesitation on this entire war between Ukraine and Russia where I feel like I'm given partial information designed to influence me mm-hmm. into one position, which is unfettered, unthinking, unquestioned loyalty to the virtue of Ukraine's cause. Yeah. I, and I feel like you could be right that I, I I don't stand lockstep in my position. I look at I try to take the Russia blinders off and I'm not saying you have them or anyone else has them. But we all have inherent built in biases toward a certain part- position based on how polarizing the idea of Russia has become in our domestic and international politics. Yeah, well, we, what's my bias on that? I don't know what it would be. I, I, I don't I think probably a bias that if you're blaming it on Ru- Not your bias. I think Mm -hmm. it's mine, too. Mm -hmm. If you're blaming it on Russia, I'm inherently skeptical of you because you blame everything on Russia. Mm. And as a result, you scream Russia and I seem I scream BS. Prove it to me first. It's a good point. Whereas there's a lot of reason, you know, know, people in the intel community who say Russia does a lot of stuff. Right. A lot of stuff that you never see publicly, which is why they're more inclined to say maybe it was Russia. But the rest of us who live in the political discourse are sick of hearing Russia the boogeyman all over the place. Every election, every every scandal, it's all Russia. It can't all be Russia. So which one of those are you ramming down my throat? And so I understand that view and incl- I'm inclined to say, OK, don't tell me again that Russia did this thing called sabotaging their own pipeline. Then I try to step back from that bias and say, okay, who really did it? Mm -hmm. Because we deserve to know who really did it. Or maybe we don't, but I don't have a government I trust at this point to be straight with me about it either way. So I I look at the arguments on both sides. I hear what what you, what Tucker, what others say, and it makes sense to me. I'm I'm not saying it's all in the same camp, but it makes sense what Biden said about it won't exist. It makes sense if uh, the Blinken. Secretary of State is Blinken. saying, what a great development. Like, right. it makes sense since that's their pipeline. Like, all of those make sense, and it could be right. It also makes sense that Putin's, Putin's very desperate, and he needs to fracture the NATO alliance to salvage himself. Is he a chess player in that way right now, willing to blow up his own pipeline? I don't know. I just know he's really desperate and probably won't use nuclear weapons, even though he'll say, saber rattle about it all the way. I just don't see – what I don't see is I want to lead to an off-ramp, and I don't think we can just say let's declare peace, but tell me how the thing de-escalates right now. So I really like your point about check. Now that you've explained it to me, I really like your point about check your biases. So I I mean I think I asked you honestly like what are my biases going on? Because I I don't have – if anything, I would think my bias would be anti-Russia because I mean I'm a Gen X. Yeah. I, I grew up in the Cold War, right? I'm inherently skeptical of Russia. But I probably have become somewhat what you described, like you've cried wolf for five years and blamed everything in the world on Russia. And and here you are using Russia again as your scapegoat. And I can't and you're telling me immediately it's true with no evidence. That's the thing. The no evidence part is what really catches me. And then, by the way, the other bias is I do feel manipulated by my government on a whole host of subjects over the last two years. Obviously, COVID, misinformation, whatever it may be, I am inherently skeptical of anyone saying to me, I am 100 percent certain this is the answer. This is what it is. And you shouldn't question it. And you're not allowed the other to question it. We'll shut you down. And if you, you don't get any it. evidence. Yes. You don't get any evidence. <laughs> no. And if you question it, you'll be censored on, on social media. So I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But I can't allow that to close any doors in my mind on to the absolute truth, whatever that that truth may be. All I know is this. I need truth. I, we are saber rattling, stumbling, autopiloting into a nuclear Standoff. Don't tell me this is about NATO anymore. 
I'm sorry. That, that, remember, that was the original idea. It's like, got to defend the NATO alliance. No, the NATO alliance is not under threat right now. This is, this is a, a territorial fight over, over what, who controls and positions Ukraine, who defines it, and then who retaliates if someone strikes. This is ex- all the, you know, when you study foreign policy in college, all the little dots that start to connect toward a larger war are emerging. That's how World War One yeah. started. Just all the little, okay, we're annexing this. And if you attack it, it's part of us. And, and pipelines and other things being pulled. Now it's with nuclear weapons. It's, yes. it's a whole nother game. Just find me someone, and, and I mean this earnestly, with a leg- legitimate seat, spot at the table who's saying, here's a deal to be had. I don't, maybe there is no deal to be had with Vladimir Putin. Maybe he doesn't want one. Maybe he wants perpetual war to tamp down domestic dispute. I, I don't know. To your point, World War One started with the annexations of very small territories that meant nothing to America, right? Yep. In the grand scheme. World War II started with economic sanctions on Japan for us, for America. Started with economic sanctions on Japan where they no longer had ready access to fossil fuels. And they at that point realized we are going to ultimately, imminently end up in a war with the United States of America. Let's strike first at Pearl Harbor. So we want a war, a world war over Donbass? Like, I, right, right. I don't want so and that's this time, we're, and that's this we're in time with agreement. nukes. This, this, and this is where we're in total agreement. I don't even know necessarily what our differences are. I mean, I think I think most of the differences that I have come from being a recovered neocon who's sort of was very invested in foreign wars and, and the outcome of those wars for a long time. And that was the lens through which I saw, you know, international conflict. But I, I actually think the scars and revelations coming out of that have led me to be increasingly skeptical of any of these interventions and what you get from them. Uh it's all still tr- computed and translated through that mindset, and it's hard because I, I, I want U.S. strength and I want U.S. leadership, and it, I don't want to be party to the, the, the anti-war left either. And so what that world looks like, I, don't, I think that's part of what the Republican Party conservative movement is figuring out right now. I don't. I don't have the the, the whole answer. But. And, and to me, the answer is it's not. It's not. It's not akin to the anti-war left. Because the anti-war left is built upon the philosophical principle that violence is in, always wrong, that Correct. violence is never a useful tool, which is childish. The world is – the story of humanity is one of conquest, and if you are not willing to use violence to protect yourself, you will be conquered. Yes. And so it's, it's a childish vision of the world of John Lennon, you know, whatever um, – give peace a chance mm-hmm. or whatever it may be. We Imagine. all prefer yeah. – yeah, we all prefer peace. Unfortunately, peace is accomplished through strength. Mm-hmm. You know, um, this time, though, what what is guiding me is America first. Mm-hmm. Just help me. And it's the burden is upon you. If you are the one making the case that you're taking us as a people closer to war, the burden is upon you to tell me why this serves the American interest. You're exactly right. And I look back and reflect on 20 years of what could be encapsulated effectively as hubris. Of not not ever understanding what could be the cascading domino effects of American action. So American action A might look righteous and great, but what happens with B, C, and D, the other uh, unintended consequences that spring from it? We have no idea. So now we've got new countries in NATO. We've gotten closer to Russian borders. Who follows Putin if Putin's out? If we want to get rid of him. What give, makes you think this guy's going to be a reformer or not? We don't know that at all. Now mm-hmm. – you got Zelensky held up in a pedestal. What's what? What is he in, incentivized to do? And all this money is, we don't know where it's going, and we don't know what effect it'll have. It's terrible. Story two: Can a grown man should a grown man wear a jersey? So <laughs> you're not going in order. <laughs> I'm going in my order. So I think I un, I sprung this on Hegseth no. last week or the week before on Fox and Friends during the commercial break, and it surprised you. In that I said, hey, I don't know that you should be wearing that jersey. Because I wear a Minnesota Vikings jersey for every single game. Yeah, you do. I do. I also, on occasion, on Saturdays and Sundays, will wear basketball jerseys as tank tops. And you will wear... Around the house. And you wear your purple Jordans. Correct. I wear a purple wristband. Like, you okay. wear the, like when you say a wristband... Like, like sweatband. Sweat sweat you wear sweatbands. Do you know why I wear the sweatband? <laughs> Not two, one... You know when I started wearing the sweatband was the Brett Favre year because he wore a sweatband. And I thought it was cool, and I bought the same white hat they had that year, and I wore my Favre <laughs> jersey and the white hat and the wristband. And I've kept the wristband ever since from that magical season, and I wear it every game, and I wear it 
socks, Viking socks, Viking shoes. Are you superstitious? Jersey, hat, wristband. No, I'm not superstitious at all. I just I'm a full participant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> If they called me and said, Pete, you're in, I'd be ready. You're ready. I'm ready. I just, there's something about it. I, I only have three hours a week where I zone out of the, the world. I mean, that and church. So if, if that, three hours a week where I'm like, I don't care what else is going on, babe. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what the kids are doing. I hope you join in. But otherwise, everything else is out. And I just, I want to maximize the enjoyment of it. And I find wearing purple Gets gets me into it. You say it's not manly. You say it's a little. Can we say that a little douchey? Okay. I don't know if we can. I don't know if we can either. But we did. I think it's awesome. And and if you come, <laughs> if, if you come to the Midwest, I don't know. Maybe this is a Midwest thing. You have to tell me about Texas. You come to you go to Iowa, Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota, Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, it's green jerseys. We wear jerseys. Go to a Vikings game. Am I being elitist? I think you might be. I mean, it's a Dallas thing. If you, if I would, we asked Sean Duffy, and he was on my team on. He this. did not he agree from, with me. He's he's a Green Bay Packer fan from Wisconsin. But he's a, a congressman elite. Is oh, a here different we go. Thing, yeah. You know, we'll have to ask. But do does everyone at at, at at the Cowboys Stadium wear a jersey, or most people dress? No, Dallas is actually in this. This is my brethren, uh, notoriously bad fans. Not n- does not exhibit the level of passion one might find in Pittsburgh. And that's a fact about Cowboys fans. It's true. Um, maybe because we've adopted this persona that it, it's it's somehow, I don't know, undignified or it is unmanly to to be wearing a jersey. I have jerseys. I've worn jerseys. I've, I don't think I've ever seen you wear a jersey. Mostly only on television. Every time you do video, <laughs> every time you do video reactions to the game, which I watch, you're always in like a Dallas Cowboys t-shirt. Uh, See, what you are not fully committed. You wear your team name but you don't wear you the always jersey like since you were a kid were the vikings is it only the vikings yeah. and was it always the vikings? i had a brief flirtation with the minnesota packers when i was like 12 13 14 what is that the minnesota packers no, no excuse me the green bay packers oh did i say minnesota packers yeah damn uh, i had a i were basically i think it's was just sheer rebellion okay. and they were better than the vikings so how kids are they go with the but winner with the wolves you do this with the wolves uh, i don't do it with the wolves i don't do it with the twins I would. I like the Twins, but I can't watch 162 games. But I can commit yeah. to 17. Yeah. I can commit to 17, and I'm I'm all in ready. So I think you need to reconsider your position. You're, you're so standing in judgment of the unwashed masses like him, like him. who wear jerseys. Because everyone out there, they probably wear a jersey. I have a closet full of jerseys. In fact, if my wife's team is playing, the Saints, I've got a Taysom Hill jersey. And I'll put it on. And I'll pull for the Saints. Okay. This I'll pull for the Saints for her. For her. This is fascinating. Okay. Because you just altered where I was going to go with this conversation. Um, first of all, a lot of there are there are perceptions about you that people don't fully appreciate, like the fact that you are OCD. You have <laughs> everything in your office perfectly in place. Mm-hmm. But this is not about you now. Okay. Okay. So don't but in part this will be about you. All right. So I had this fascinating conversation with a buddy of mine this past week about the difference between honesty and trustworthiness and i think in my mind i had always associated those two traits those two qualities as synonymous so if you lie to me right you're you're inherently trust untrustworthy yep and you're dishonest you would think my friend said is that right he goes i don't know i don't know if that's 100 percent true there are people that i trust that are dishonest and i said what are you talking about like tell me about that and he goes well what if i told you um i know somebody that would lie but they wouldn't lie to me or how about this? Like, um, I said, to, I was talking to this friend of mine. I said, would that person steal? He goes, not from me. <laughs> <laughs> so the Venn and diagram. I got, it, I got it all of a sudden. I'm like, so you're talking about, I see the separation. Now, the reason I said this is not about you because you're an honest guy. But you know what you are? Is you're, I think you're a trustworthy guy. Like, if you're on the team, mm-hmm. you're, on you're on the, the team. team. This yes. is like you talking about this weekend on Fox and Friends. Like, if you were Ukrainian. You would want Vladimir Zelensky. Yes. Even though he's dishonest. If you were a Ukrainian, yes. Yes. So you you are on the team with the Vikings. Like, on the t- You but, are. But I, that's why I was prepared to go until you told me that you also pull out a Saints jersey. And now I have a – now now all of a sudden I'm, I'm rethinking it all. I'm on Jen's <laughs> team. No, no, no. I'm on my wife's team. So the hierarchy team. of teams. Yes, I'm on my wife's team. Now, geographically, I'm located now in Tennessee, so I'm, I'm willing to adopt the Titans in, in as my AFC team. 
Okay, I actually bought my whole family jerseys. Of the Titans. Of the Titans. So customized have, jerseys with their names on the back. Right. So now you have three. A minute ago, I was, I, was, I, was, I was talking up your trustworthiness that if you're on the team. And now inside of your, your, your castle, the Hegseth Castle, you've allowed three different affiliations. Because sports affiliation is a far lower <laughs> allegiance. Okay? My first allegiance is the Vikings for always. Then to my wife. Then to my home state, which I've now fully embraced. So my higher allegiances lead to some compromise in the lower allegiances, which is jersey purchases. I don't know where jersey purchases are in the hierarchy of allegiances, but temporarily I'm fine showing full commitment to each in their proper I place. I feel like your, your flow chart is like the federal code. Like only you can understand it. Yep. <laughs> And you can try to communicate it to me and like how it all works together. And there's some cohesive, rational flow to this. No, I actually just... realized it all broke down when I told you about a Saints jersey. <laughs> <laughs> it all... <laughs> I saw your face just go like this. <laughs> and it's, it's OK. It's OK. I don't have any other jerseys of any other team. Story three, Tennessee. You Tennessee. now live in Tennessee. I do. And I love it. And you live on a uh, not a farm. Not a ranch. Not it's not big enough to be a ranch. I don't know what the ranch threshold is. I had this conversation with a buddy. Okay. How big does That's your a Texas conversation? I don't know. I would say you got probably have a hundred acres. That does that seem low to call it a ranch? Uh, ranchette. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you could probably claim ranchette. Uh, so what? Do you, what would you? What would you argue? Two fifty? Five hundred? I think five hundred is probably a good number. Yeah, we do not have a ranch. <laughs> <laughs> but what, so why did you move to Tennessee, and what is it like so far? Uh, we're so, so grateful, so grateful to Fox as well for the opportunity to do that. Life-wise, I'm in the same position as you coming back for the show and, and love that. Uh, it was about our kids. It really did come down to finding the best possible school we could find for them. Uh, I wrote the book about classical Christian education for that research. I went to three different States that we thought we might want to be in and went to a dozen schools. We found this one, uh, in Tennessee, outside of Nashville that we just fell in love with. And then the dominoes kind of fell into place. It made sense. Jen could do it. I could do it. Uh, but it was I, right in the book about a radical reorientation of your life around the education of your kids. And it was just time. We were ready to do it. And I guess the older you get, the more you want to be out and away. And that's, it's just, we're out in the country and it's, it's faith, it's freedom, it's church, it's school, it's the people. What's the difference like, culturally? Just culturally. I mean, I love – everywhere I've been, you meet people who are wonderful. It's just the culture of the place is friendly. It's proud, if you know what I mean. Like they fly the Tennessee flag like they do in Texas. Like there's an ethos around the place. Everything is, you know, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. It's – there's churches everywhere. Uh, the food is phenomenal. The weather is great. The taxes are much lower and there's just freedom. Like I, we, I, we know you and I both know people who are building their houses and they it's taking them months to just get permits. Mm. That's just not a thing. I mean, yes, you need permits to do big. It's, it's just the latitude to be who you are. I hear two things at night. I hear crickets and gunshots. <laughs> That's all I hear. That's all we hear. We have no ambient light. Like you couldn't find us on a Google map if you tried. And that's, where we want to be, uh, I, we're just – we're grateful to God for the opportunity. First of all, our, our entire family, and it's also family-wise, we're hoping to, to bring all seven of our kids to the same spot. And we think this is because of a mix, mixed family, blended family situation. We're hoping the Nashville area could and would be that. So that's a prayer for us. You know, I mean I take it for granted. Um, I don't take it for granted, but I might um, think it's unique. The the thing you said about pride, obviously, because we wear it on T-shirts and hats and say it, there's a lot of pride in Texas. Mm -hmm. I know I've lived there for a short period of time that there's a, a lot of pride in Tennessee. There's a lot to be said about the value of regional pride. I was just sitting there as you were talking. I was thinking about it and I was thinking, does it apply to cultural pride? Is that a good thing? Because then you kind of get into ethnic pride. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yep. I mean, look, look, you came from New Jersey, so there's a lot of pride in, the, in, in Italians, right? Yep, a lot of them. Uh, their, their food and their culture, their ethnic heritage. I was thinking about all these different prides, but I think there's something really uniquely good about regional pride because it's not a closed door. 
you, it's open to everyone yep. of every race, every yep. culture, every background. It's open to immigrants, you know, provided that you appreciate and adopt, you know. Yep. And it, it also, to me, reflects investment. So, you know, that thing they say where nobody washes a rental car. No one, no one, <laughs> no, one no one takes a rental car yep. to the car wash. Mm-hmm. Why? You don't own it. It's not yours. You have no skin in the game and you see no returns on the investment. Right. Mm-hmm. Regional pride is about. I, I just I just had this conversation with Tucker Carlson on the last episode uh, here on the Will Kane podcast, and, and I said I think I'm a communitarian, which in the essence is what America was founded upon this idea of federalism, right? Because your community reflects your values if you invest. So that's what regional pride is. Like I can see, you know, what I've invested in this community come back in the values of the community. Yes. Round here, that's not how we do things. Where's running around? No, me, oh, yeah, me, that, that, sort of, that sort yeah. of ethos yeah. is like that's not how we do things. And I guess in the places where we had our kids in, in different times, you almost had to fully cocoon yourself to to have your values be reflected. And and that's how values are perpetuated and culture is perpetuated. And you could get the same values for New Jersey if you find the certain spot in Tennessee and Nashville yeah. or yeah. Memphis or wherever. I, it, I it, for sure. Boils down to families often. Right? It boils down to families schools and churches yeah. i believe and the ability to and and making those three overlap as much as possible mm. and that to me is 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 how we've tried to look at and right now we family wise you know we're 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 trying to figure that out but it's great uh school wise we know we we're where we want to be and then we're ch- searching for churches to try to find the right one but part of it is to find one that overlaps so that People you see at school or the people you see at church are the people that your kids encounter so that all the things you care about are reinforced at some level. Because otherwise, cultural – yes, you're a communitarian. I like that phrase. But our culture is increasingly national and international. Yeah, it's monolithic. Meaning, me, monolithic, meaning your kids, what they're seeing in their phones, if they have them, is way outside of whatever the community influences You know what's on. interesting? Um, when, I, when Tucker and I were talking about this, I, I almost feel like he pushed back on me a little bit because he said, yes, but we have to have a national – set of values to which we all adhere. So you know what's interesting about what you described? I, I'm with you, and I hate the monolithic American culture. Like I like that Texas and, and Boston have different accents, and I like that we listen to yeah. different musics. But, 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 but what we're becoming is a monolith on the superficial level. Yes. Music, movies, you know, we're becoming to where we have no, no common yeah. set of values at the deeper level. That's what Tucker's talking about. Yep. We have to have some buy-in nationally about what it is to be an American well, and we, what the American Not only are we not is. getting buy-in, we're, we're, we're getting further and further apart. We're getting destruction. Yeah. Yeah. Further apart and the attempt to destroy whatever is there as our common, For our sure. common culture. But I, to wrap it all up, I, we love it. Absolutely. It's, no, it's the first time I've actually chosen – Jen and I actually chosen precisely where we want to live. And we thank God for all the dominoes to come together in that way. And it's the first time I'm like, we're flying the state flag as a reflection of what, of my values. Have you ever flown the Minnesota flag? What do you, I don't even know what the Minnesota flag looks like. It's blue. It's got a thing in the middle. What a good, what a good immigrant. I'm assimilating. I am, I'm assimilated. an assimilated <laughs> immigrant. I'm su- I'm, I'll have a slight accent soon because I'm a total mimicker. Absolutely. I know that about myself. Once I get somewhere, I get so I'm I'm already t- teaching Gwen say y'all. You know, <laughs> I, I want a, a little girl with a, a sweet Southern accent. So we are all all in. Story four is the Republic lost. I hate to do this with our last conversation. Um, oh, our last one we just had a little bit. It does. Yes. OK, I want to lay this out again. This is a continuation of a conversation that I've begun to have. And I, I, I think it's an important one in that. We need to be able to have this conversation about this moment in history honestly. So I think it's very fair to say, and I could bring on guests who would who would espouse this, that there are some elements. I do not think it's large on the right who believe that the republic is already lost. This is on the right, mm-hmm. okay? And what they mean by that, and I've because I've read about it and I listened to them talk, the administrative state, which I've talked about, is so vast, so such a behemoth and so on autopilot that you can't just cycle in random politicians on four to eight year cycles and expect them to actually effectuate any change. OK, so some have made the argument you need a competent CEO. You need a strong man, you need a Caesar to cut it down to size. Now, I've had that conversation at a deeper level with people, um, very smart people, 
some on this and some off about how bad of an idea that is because mm-hmm. because what comes after there you know when it, when you have a strong man led government um of any type no one considers what comes after even if you had the most if even if you were a historical and had the most benevolent right no one does it doesn't it. end with a new George Washington who says, I had all the power. Now we're going back Dude, to the Republic. It shows how rare George Washington was yeah. as, a, as a historical figure. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about an amazing figure who declined that power. Yep. Right? Because who gets it second? George Washington's son? And what kind of ne'er do well is he? Yeah. Right? <laughs> yes. I, don't, I actually don't know. I don't know. He may have been great. But often they are. Yeah. Um, so the point is, the, what drives this conversation, and what in my estimation would lead me and I think Tucker made this point as well, is no, this experiment is such the historical anomaly that even if it's a bleak moment, you have to fight for its foundation. But what leads people into that question is the feeling that it's already been lost. Do you think the republic has been lost? I hope not. I fear they could be ahead of the curve on that. Uh, I think we talked about this previously as well. The way they treated Trump, I think, was an exposure of the way previous Republicans had been treated, presidents, but it was never quite exposed the way they came after Trump because of the blunt nature in which he spoke and the heart, the, the way he went at issues that were at the heart of the administrative state. He was also a political rookie, so he showed up with, without all of his feet underneath him and with a group of people that he thought would be excellent in politics and turned out, you know – They weren't in for the kind of fight he was talking about. So in 2024, if it's Trump, I don't that reaction will be even more hyperbolic and even more extreme. Uh, And to be clear, you're not talking about the media reaction. No, no, no. I'm talking about. Correct. I'm talking about inside the administrative state. Yeah. Inside the agencies of power. Right. Underneath the political appointees, the leaks, the DOJ, the FBI. Do they continue to be weaponized? The intelligence apparatus. The intelligence apparatus. So the question is, Trump is not the fair case. And I hope it is Trump in 2024. I've been open about that. But if in 24 or 28, it is some other Republican, whether it's Ron DeSantis or someone like him, uh, how is that Republican treated? And if they get the full Trump treatment, I think that's as close to a sign as we could get politically that. The republic is irredeemably damaged in that the these entire the fourth estate, the entire you know fourth branch of government, which is the administrative state, effectively runs the show run by the far left of our country. That that to me is the other the other part of the conversation is you asked, is our republic lost? And I used to I used to I've, it's always been a pet peeve of mine to talk about we're not a democracy. We're a republic. It's getting to be less of a pet peeve and more of a main argument for me. Mm. Because you hear it from the left. They don't say, is our republic lost? They say, is our democracy lost? In fact, they say the same thing. They're having the same parallel conversation we're having right now based on a straw man argument that we are a democracy. And as a result, uh, we've lost our democracy because we're an inherently evil country, you know, built on the backs of slaves and the electoral college is from slavery. And and, you know, look, the inequitable way the Senate votes, you know, how why does Wyoming get right? You know, all these votes and California doesn't. That's inequitable. So they want to toss out the republic in advance of a democracy without any understanding of how our founders said democracies end in tyranny because the majority eventually takes things away from the minority. Yes. So we're having parallel conversations. Uh, I, I hope and pray we, my, my approach is a book called the Benedict option. And it was written uh, by Rod Dreher and it was about Christian communities, but he was basically saying Christendom in America is gone. So you need to retreat into communities where you can revive that sentiment until we have one, two, three, four percent of Americans or Christians willing to then re- re-engage with the culture. Because if we try to be the culture, we're going to lose the culture. So I think saving the re- – that's why I've gone back to schools as a centerpiece of it is schools and churches. We're not going to win in political warfare. It's not going to happen. The only way we take our republic back is by retraining two generations of young people who are truly grounded in faith, truly grounded in the basics, and then they enter our body politic and entertainment that's a long-term exercise, and what happens in the interim, I don't know. Oh, man. I don't know. I actually really love that answer. And um, 
I know he's like a devoted listener to the Will Kane podcast. You know, <laughs> you we, you wove together several themes that I've been talking about in the last couple of weeks. In that, uh, like I said, I'm a communitarian. Yep. I believe in local investment. Um, I just did a whole thing on the power of a small minority. That three to four percent actually dictates the cultural direction of anything. Of anything. Mm-hmm. If that three to four percent is intransigent, intolerant. I don't mean those as negatives. Yep. Meaning, I don't accept another outcome. Yep. You know. Um, they will actually bend the will of the majority. The, the consensus isn't actually a dedicated proposition. Most of them is people following the path of least resistance, mm-hmm. you know, and I inherently like it because it's an optimistic vision. Like what you just, I don't know if I'm optimistic. You don't know, but you th- but- I think you might think that's pessimistic to me. It's not because it empowers people. I like the whole political thing. That's pessimistic to me because it's like, it's, it's banging your head against a wall or it's playing an overly complicated game where the rules are often, yeah. But, man, I can go make my life better. Yep. I can go improve my family. I can live according to values. I can improve my community. Yep. I can be a positive member of this region. You know, that's optimistic to me because it, it, it's inherently action-based, action-focused. Like, I know for me personally, I am su- – the, the one big dictator of my stress level is how much control I have. It isn't success or failure. Like, I've started businesses and failed. Mm-hmm. Not that big a deal. Don't love it. Yeah. But when I am t- super stressed and you and I talk about this, yeah. it's when I don't have control. Yep. And so like this, this whole like huge project of the political apparatus of America, I don't have, I don't have some, I don't have control over that, but I do have control over my house and, and, <laughs> and my yes. community yes. and I can invest and I, I can take action and that makes me optimistic. And I think it took me 40 years of my life to figure that out. And we, we get paid to clamp, you know, to, to have a conversation at the national level but the real utility is right there grounded in the dirt and the, of the people you are around and what you can impact. That we can do. And Now, what you're also saying is – what we're also seeing, though, is people are choosing to live together in communities, which is not necessarily good for the republic in that you have bright red parts of the country and bright blue parts of the country trying to live together in, in, at a national level, which are going to be increasingly further apart from each other culturally, religiously. I don't know how that reconciles itself. It was the vision of the republic. It, we, were, we were not just a republic. We were a federal republic, a federalist I, republic. I love it. But and it, it shared. People like in Tucker Virginia said, could live in one way and people in you know Michigan could live another but way. But like Tucker said, you still have to have an overarching set of national beliefs and mm-hmm. ethos that are shared. And tell me what we share. National defense. Two big <laughs> oceans. <laughs> <laughs> we will not be. We will only be invaded by ourselves and our idiocracy, uh, it won't be somebody else, to your point. That's exactly right. Man, this was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. I Love loved it. it. There you go. That's four big stories with Will and Pete. Leave a comment below. Go to foxnewspodcast.com and subscribe to the Will Came Podcast for an audio version of this show. Always check back in here at the Fox News YouTube channel for the latest episode of the Will Kane Podcast. Hey, it's Will Kane. Click here to subscribe to the Fox News channel on YouTube. It's the best way to get our latest interviews and highlights. And click to subscribe to the Will Kane podcast for full episodes right now.